My name is Justin Seitz. I live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. I spent a number of years working in offensive cybersecurity, sysadmin coding before that, and kind of came into my own in OSINT uh, 2014, 2015, when my wife and I, Claire, uh, started Dark River Systems, created Hunchly. And since then, I've been busy uh, building that team. We have some exciting stuff coming in 2023 to announce. And as well, we've uh, spent a lot of time working for organizations like the International Criminal Court, the Center for Advanced Defense Studies in Washington, D.C. And I also am an advisor at the Human Rights Lab at Berkeley, California. How do people in my profession utilize OSINT in my work? So that's a tricky one for me. I use OSINT in every possible way imaginable. So I use OSINT to help my kids with school. I teach them how to do basic things like research on Google. I use OSINT in my victim advocacy work that I do um, to help people that are victims of crime or maybe don't have a ton of legal support. Every day, you know, effectively nine to five, I'm either building products or working on an intelligence team doing the work. So it's one of those things that, again, I'm always telling people that there's really not much you can't use OSINT for, whether you're an athlete looking for better workouts or whatever it is, the better you are at it, the better you're going to be at finding information that's relevant for your life. So I think where one of my favorite cases where I got to use OSINT as well as my reverse engineering skills and a whole bunch of other things. I was working with a hedge fund analyzing um, a Chinese tech company. And this tech company had been accused of fraud in China, had been accused of fraud in America and other places. And so myself, along with a research analyst at the hedge fund, uh, took a hard look at this company. So the first thing we actually did was just general kind of OSINT and reconnaissance and took a look at their website. And you know, if hedge fund always wants to know how does this company make money? And can we actually then correlate to how they say they make money to what's in their filings? So we began digging through their website and it was pretty interesting because initially it looks like a normal kind of, you know, a website that you would browse to say, if you're buying shoes or something, it would feel very familiar to you. Um, however, behind the scenes, you know, the first tip always that I give people is make sure you're looking at the data flowing back and forth in your browser, right? Uh, looking at some of the data that's being transferred, you know, do a right click view source, that kind of thing. So as I was doing that, and there was like a bunch of data that was being passed back and forth uh, between the browser and this Chinese company servers, um, in the JSON, the, the kind of the blobs of code going by, I actually noticed that there were tarballs or archives, zip files that were referenced in this one particular field. So um, I was able to figure out based on the file name and kind of where it related in the website without using anything like brute forcing, which could be argued as uh, illegal. Um, I was just able to just request that tar uh, file uh, as an authorized paying user and download it. So when I download the file, uh, what it is is actually a very detailed play-by-play um, -play of how users are interacting with the platform during a user session. So uh, what this allowed me to do, again, starting manually along with a team of researchers, is looking at how does data move around in this thing? Where can I find maybe a source of information where I can kind of blow out my intelligence graph of how the system works? So of course, once I found one tar file, then I downloaded many tar files, as many as I was authorized to for the things that I was signed up for. Um, then I was able to kind of take hundreds of thousands of rows of data and begin using other techniques that weren't intelligence, but more visualization. So I took all of this data and kind of brought it all together. And then we looked at the patterns of how users were using the platform and how they were kind of interacting with it. And what we found was that um, this platform sold different services, like vastly different services. So let's say like massage services and auto mechanics. What you would see is, um, and they were tracking all the IP addresses as well. They left all this data sitting like, because you were part of this service, like 
you want to call it a course or whatever, um, your data was in there too. So you can actually see how all of these users would show up to this one service related to massages at the same time. And then you would see their interactions kind of like that as the humans would remain. And then all of a sudden those same users would show up on the automotive side, like 15 minutes later. And so we were like, okay, we're fairly certain that they're running bots, right? Um, it was pretty obvious uh, in the data. So then it actually was really cool because then we used human intelligence where we were able to interview people who used to work at this company. And they do in fact disclose to us that, oh yeah, I mean, you figured it out. Uh, there's like entire like racks of bot, you know, equipment at this place, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it was interesting because what it allowed us to do was that human intelligence then allowed us to zoom back out and uh, I don't do accounting stuff, but the accounting people were able to kind of look at the numbers and how money was flowing in and out of this company. Uh, we were comparing it against filings. And then we were able actually to show how money basically would come into this company. And then um, all these accounts would buy things. And then effectively you would get those accounts would kind of later refund them and what it was the company was just paying a bot company to like show up generate traffic and revenue and then disappear and they would carve off 10 percent on the way by right so the money would just flow in a circle so the company could make it look like there's these huge amounts of users when in fact they're just paying this bot company uh like false money right so you, uh the nice thing is is like yes uh, you can tell that over time if you continue to do that you'll go broke right because uh, every time that money tra passes by, you lose that 10%. Um, so yeah, uh, moral of the story is nobody believed us. Uh, it, it sucked. Uh, and then we couldn't figure out why. And later we learned it wasn't that nobody believed us. Actually, a, um, a Chinese hedge fund had manipulated the market around this particular company when the news broke. And we found out much too late. Uh, and the company subsequently is, I think, effectively bankrupt now or very close to it. It's uh, in the tank. I'm not sure if it's listed anymore or anything like that. Uh, and so it was awesome. It was like this huge, like it had everything. It had forensic accounting. It had Qmint. It had OSINT, visualization work. Uh, it was a lot of fun. The outcome in the end was great, but at the time was not a lot of fun that uh, people didn't believe that this fraud was going on. And there were numerous people kind of uh, screaming it from the rafters. So I was uh, fortunate. I got to work behind the scenes, uh, not out in the public uh, kind of eye and do a lot of this work, but the, the challenge and just all the different facets I got to touch, including some Android uh, reversing as well. Uh, it was really cool. So when I am asked to deal with large data sets or when I've encountered, you know, or accumulated large data sets during my research before, uh, it's always been a challenge for me. I'm not trained as a data scientist um, and don't have a comp sci degree. And it does start to stretch your ability as an amateur uh, developer to be able to work with data that way. So my approach is always pretty simple. I try to think about how can I get this data down into Microsoft Excel, right? So that's the first thing I ask myself to do. Uh, if there are 100 million rows of data, and uh, recently I worked with some colleagues where um, I took 20 million contracts, government contracts in a foreign country and analyzed them with Python. Uh, it, pretty simply, actually not difficult, but the size of the data was the problem because everything took a long time. Um, and anytime you had mistakes or something, you had to kind of rework all of the data. Uh, the cool thing is, is that I still reduce it down to like, okay, we've got this hundred million rows. I'm going to pluck out the first 10. I'm going to put it in a spreadsheet and I'm going to read it like all of it, every field. I'm going to understand what does all this stuff mean? I'm going to Google the headers. So if you're looking at data, you're not familiar with, don't just look at it and go, Hmm, like look at the information you know, the labels, the headers on spreadsheets, um, Google those things, make sure you really understand what you're looking at, at 10 rows of data, and then start thinking about how do I wanna get this into a format I can work with? I always use Excel sheets, like always. 
Uh, I use other technologies like graph databases, Neo4j and similar technologies when I'm loading like tens of millions of rows and I want to show relationships or cut them down or whatever. But it's all really, I still, when I'm done in a graph, I take that graph and I bring it into Excel so that I can read through it and understand it. It also means that most of my audience are not going to be technical. So I have to apply the lens of the user to my own data, and that's going to be through Excel or report and Word. And if I can't distill the data down in that way, then I probably should revisit what I'm doing or what I'm trying to answer. So this all sounds like a really long process, but it's not. It's just really like, does this look good in Excel? No. Why? Right? Like, why doesn't this make sense? Is Can I not use Excel? Like, um, if I have to do a graph, although they're pretty, they're really tough uh, network graphs, I mean, right, with nodes and edges. Uh, there's great meaning uh, at times, but also like completely the wrong stories being told or they're too messy or... I often only use them when I want to highlight maybe um, the size of something or uh, how relevant the connection is. So for example, if I have 400,000 rows of data uh, and they're kind of all connected by one person, I'll show a graph because I can show this two messy clusters of junk, you know, and like mica right in the middle, right? And it's like, that's the bad guy right there. So um, I think it's also like, a true data scientist and actually on our team at Hunchly, we have someone who's, you know, has this training. Um, they apply the methods that are vastly different than how I would. Uh, but I still think that most of them, even when they're using tooling like Jupyter, Pandas and other stuff, they're reducing it into tables or CSVs, uh, you know, to, to kind of look at the final output. So. I don't have any massive tool recommendations. I think things like Multigo and other um, similar technologies are great because it's like a fairly accessible way to get into graph analysis. Um, but really, for anybody who's like watching this, like don't feel guilty about telling everyone you know that Excel is your number one analytical tool because it is still mine. One word, practice. It's that simple. So I think I spend a lot of time understanding how to do the basics very quickly. Um, that is the number one thing that I, even to this day, I still focus a lot of my time on doing the basics, which is like capture, timelining, um, and being able to kind of put together a, a narrative, these very basic things that do not require a bunch of fancy tools, the more time I actually spend just honing in on those things and um, using like these very, very basic investigative techniques, the more wins I get. So that's something I started doing a long time ago was I just spend more time reading things than most of my colleagues. I spend more time being skeptical. I don't believe what people write or say until I can actually corroborate it. Um, and so it's a really weird thing that you would think that I'm spending more time like writing Python or learning about machine learning or whatever. Not at all. I'm constantly trying to hone these very basic manual skills that I have um, and constantly it produces amazing results on the other side. And it also makes me uh, much, much better at developing automation because uh, the manual steps, um, you know, I've refined them enough times that I, I know how to code around them in a bunch of different ways. So that's really how I kind of got good at OSINT. And my colleagues that work with me often ask the same thing, like, what's your trick? I'm like, I just spend way more time doing mundane, boring things than most people. And I said it in a blog post probably six or seven years ago. It's just that whole tenacity thing um, that still, I'm still sending the same message today. I think the important thing is to start where you're interested. It's one of those rare cases. Um, it's generally bad career advice to follow your heart, right? I would probably be the world's worst DJ right now instead of doing this stuff. Um, and so it's important, I think, in this case, particularly with research, follow where your interest is. 
because you will find that you can sit in the research and the work much longer. Uh, you'll find it more fulfilling. Um, you'll find it more challenging um, and you will get better at it. So for me, I came at OSINT from the hacking angle because we were using OSINT to help support offensive operations, phishing, social engineering, penetration tests, right? Uh, then I took more of an interest in counterterrorism as ISIS was kind of on the rise in uh, the Middle East. So same skill sets now, just kind of with this different lens and for a number of years spent time kind of researching and looking at how propaganda travels around social media. Then again, shifted to uh, different topics along the way, human rights. And now I kind of have this more of a kaleidoscope uh, approach where I'm doing little bits of everything all over. The great thing with OSINT is that wherever your interests lie, the skills you develop, they're going to follow you everywhere, but don't do stuff you don't want to do. Like if you hate looking at war crime stuff, don't do it. Don't volunteer for that. Find something else. If you love the hacking world, there are a ton of opportunities to get into hacking via OSINT, right? Um, so it's really about the same message I continue to give people, which is really um, do the work that you enjoy, that you feel fulfilling. And um, if you can't, if like, say your job is like 50% fulfilling, there are a ton of organizations like ATII, sorry, the uh, Anti-Trafficking Intelligence Initiative, the National Child Protection Task Force, um, Trace Labs. I mean, there's endless opportunities for you to, to give back. You can do advocacy work in your local community for public defenders, uh, whatever it is, just, you know, make sure it's fulfilling because that's kind of the point of our work, right? Is that we're doing research and doing this stuff to try to make things better.